I'd like to invite uh, Mark. They do it. How they take over? That's great. Well, while you're doing that, I would say first of all, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I would like to thank EQ for um, actually allowing me to participate in this event. Um, I'm standing between you and lunch, so I, I think I have a nice opportunity to actually synthesize a lot of the discussion we've had this morning. Uh, we talked about longer life of products. We talked about great engineering and reliability. We talked about panel technologies, and I'm going to touch on those uh, because the way I approached this and our team approached this was we're not worrying about competing against different people in the solar supply chain. It's really how do we have solutions that let us compete against natural gas, right? Well, that's what we're trying to replace, right? So we need all the technology that all the companies here can bring to help with that challenge. And so when uh, my heavy PowerPoint opens up, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But Alliant is, just to describe it, is a company, like many, is born of frustrated engineers who were very upset about all the problems they had, you know? How they, they found out there was two ways to lose a lot of money in solar. One was bad geotech, and then you're drilling, 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 and your schedule's wrong. And the other was you built your plant, and then you miss pro forma because they can't keep it clean. And so we're going to talk about a couple of technologies and approach to uh, resolving those issues. So, uh, so this is a line, and there you see our tracker. It's a ballasted tracker uh, going up over a hill. It can go up to 15%, 8.5 degrees in any direction, north, south, east, and west. Again, frustrated engineers trying to never have to deal with the issue. And we also have cleaning robots, which I think I can push. So when we look at this, and so we've talked about an industry, how do we win versus natural gas? Well, it's simple. One, capture the most energy. So have a tracker that can do a whole you know, 120 degrees of rotation, not, not just 40, 60 on each side. Build efficiently. Don't drill, right? Don't do geotech if you can avoid it. And then, like this morning's discussion, why aren't we talking 50 year? A combined cycle gas plant is a 50 year refinance package. It's a generator in a building. And we are all CapEx, yet we, because we like to stick metal posts in the ground that corrode and we like to use bad back sheets on modules, we're limiting the life. Why are we doing that? With technology, we probably pay less and actually get more. We've got to change our goal posts. Um, and again, the other way I'd like everyone to think about this is we're a big industry. This is massive infrastructure. This is much bigger than the gas pipeline across India. So let me just walk you through this. A 72 cell panel is one meter by two meters, right? At 320 watts, that's about 3,120 modules per megawatt, or a little over three kilometers. Multiply three kilometers times 90 gigawatts, and you've got almost 300,000 kilometers. So if you just put one panel next to each other, that's 66 trips from Delhi to Shanghai. Or the other way to think about it, it's one trip that's as wider than a football pitch of panels. That's what you guys are doing. That's what we're doing as an industry. We can't have small solutions to that. We've got to think about what we're doing to avoid future problems. And for us, two issues are life of projects because of subsurface corrosion in hard corrosive environments. And the other is, how are you going to clean it? I can barely get my children to clean the windows in our house without complaining. Are you going to clean a football field all the way from Shanghai to India with, with manual labor? Labor inflates. These are 50-year assets. We have to proactively think about what the appropriate solution is. The other is, let's do the right thing. People used to think it was cool to have a wind farm in their town. Now they hate them and you can't get them permitted in much of the world. If we can keep driving posts two meters into the ground because it's nice soft soil, it's farmland and we should face into it. All right, it's arable soil. We should stop doing that if we can avoid it. And let's go put it, like the SoftBank team said, on brownfields, right? On brownfields, contaminated land. Let's do the right thing as an industry. If we don't, this is what happened on my summer vacation. I was enjoying vacation and all of a sudden I'm driving down the road in the northeast of the United States and a farmer's got a sign up saying no solar. Well, we did it to ourselves because we put a bunch of ugly projects in and we're competing for land. We have the opportunity to build in rocky places, hilly places. We can go up and down hills, salt, dust, next to active plants. If you have cleaning robots, you can clean them, right? Hard rock, avoid the uh, drilling, etc. And for us, one of the key innovations that we focused on was what are the true economics of cleaning and keeping a panel pristine? Well, one is we don't want to drive on panels. I used to be the chief commercial officer at Trina globally. And I used to pay eight to nine million dollars a year for uh, snail trails and micro cracks 
along the coast because the panels would flex and it would cause issues. And then I do sampling, and a lot of times the micro cracks are strangely shaped like human feet because people are walking on the panels and cleaning them, avoiding warranties. So I wanted a robot, and our team wanted a robot that never rode on the panel, right? Treat the panel well, but can carry loads because many places you can clean with just dry brushing. But as I heard Andre say, when you're near Delhi and you have organic pollution in the mix, you're not cleaning that with a dry brush. You're going to need liquids to mobilize the soil. So our view is have the ability to both. By having a robot that drives on concrete, it can carry heavy loads. And you'll see that in the video. Um, the other key thing is to have a robot that goes row to row automatically. Um, and that's important because instead of having 20 or 40 robots per megawatt, you can use one robot per two megawatts. Again, we're trying to design what's the lowest cost to serve in a sustainable way to take care of a solar plant. All right, so our company, and we've done, and I, I really applaud Scorpius. They're doing the right thing. We're doing the same thing. It's hard work to do all the black and veach and all the wind tunnel studies, but we're trying to make sure that these are robust solutions so our industry can adopt the right technology and not you know, suffer issues and catastrophic failures. Uh, it's absolutely the right way to do it. We have fixed tilt and single axis tracking, and then we have robots that can do many things. We focus on cleaning, so we chase dust clouds. So we, we're in Mexico, the Mideast, Australia, and India, uh, working with Tata here. Um, we just luckily won, uh, we were recognized in Mexico for the Renewable Energy Project of the Year uh, two weeks ago. Um, sorry for the Spanish, but um, the point here, it says 50-year product life, right? They're getting it, right? This, and the reason this won was this is next to a distribution center where they're selling the energy. It's on a corrosive lake bed with rocks in it. It swells in the summer like a dome. It's clay. And then it the, dries out in the dry season and turns into dust clouds. You couldn't build this effectively with other technologies. And so it let us build effectively and serve the customer. So, oops, so I think the better way than for me talking is just to show a video. So I'm going to show you three things. I'm going to show you one, the fixed tilt project. I'm going to show you the tracker. And I'm going to show you cleaning robots doing more than cleaning. All right, so our goal here was fast construction, long life. Uh, we designed in California. Uh, we, this in the fixed tilt, we worked with Trina Solar because we wanted dual glass panels for long life and high energy generation in hot environment. And we designed this cell, and all those parts are made at a Toyota supplier in southern China. In India, we're working with Tata to do it at Tata Motor Suppliers. Um, but basically, we have a dual glass panel, we put a structure on the back, and this ensures quality, right? You don't have any, we hated in our previous lives fixing torque measurements. Everyone wanted to go drinking on Friday night, so they would rush the construction, and we spent all of Saturday fixing torque measurements, okay? So we're trying to get rid of torque. So this is a clay lake bed south of Guadalajara, Mexico. As I said, very active. And you'll see the eight megawatts we put in here. It's got good density. Um, you know, the fixed tilt right in this case is a, is a landscape. We also have a portrait uh, version. But the innovation here was we're extruding concrete at a little under two kilometers a shift. So you put structure on, you don't worry about geotech, right? I don't care if there's rocks underneath there. So we extrude it out, it gives a structure not only to make construction go faster, but it also makes uh, the ro cleaning robots work effectively. So as you can see, you, these two teams of this size build eight megawatts, um, and those are the product coming right from Trina in the boxes on carts we designed. They just fold out the legs, drop them down, and you know, basically hit it with adhesive, which you'll see in a second. Uh, and then we have all of our quality is visual. There's no subsurface corrosion. There's no worry about you know, what's the friction on the, on the pile that we've driven. Um, there's no torque concern because we're looking visually at adhesive that's high contrast and we know if we have enough. And it's all about building fast, efficiently, and not needing very highly skilled labor. So, and you'll see there, you see, the, watch these next guys, you'll see them just fold the legs out and um, you know, they're going to put a crossbar on that creates the electrical connection, makes a box section so it's nice and strong, and then uh, they connect it. Okay, so, all right. Now, as we said, also if you're trying to, if you have people complaining about the visual look of solar, this is a very low profile system, very good for high wind environments on coasts where you have cyclones. So we will do uh, 
145 mile per hour and 170, uh, we need to add more concrete for that. Now, but I think to the, you know, Alan and also, uh, you know, the, the, the discussion from Scorpius is India is all about tracker, right? So what's the right solution for tracker? Can you get a tracker where you don't have to drill? Can you get a tracker that you can clean robotically? Can you get a tracker that's simple but robust? And our approach to this was a few things. One, we didn't like when we were building large torque tube trackers, carrying around on a grade all a big torque tube. We felt it was dangerous and we had to level it and it slowed things down. So we wanted a lot of ability to one, go up and over hills, which you'll see here with this tracker. But we also wanted all parts to be able to be carried by two people so we could get rid of heavy equipment on the site. The other point was we wanted to be able to manufacture quickly locally and by having smaller parts, we're able to localize quickly. So this is a earlier prototype, but um, it just shows you this is a, we hired these people off the street in Richmond, California, and then basically explain, put this thing together. And what we're doing, and what I want to explain, I would ask for a show of hands, who here is a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer? How do I pause this thing? Who's it, mechanicals or civils? Not that many. Well, I'll make it simple, okay? This is a T, which is what most trackers are. And if you notice this one, this design is an A. One is stronger than the other, right, structurally. The A is stronger. And our idea was, how do we actually take mass out but make it stronger? How do we give you cost out but actually give you better performance? So we have an A, which basically gives us a stronger structure. And then the arc is a gear, just like your bicycle. So think about a bicycle gear is like a 10 gear. You get a square on a gear. So if you want to, uh, the loads on a gear, if it's a 10 gear, you get 100 times reduction in load. So instead of having the panel directly like a sail connected to a torque tube, we decided to decouple that so we could have a more flexibility, get mass out, but still remember, remain strong. So just good, clever mechanical engineering. And um, you know, they're putting purlins on. And uh, what you're going to see is there's dual glass panels. We can use either. We like dual glass panels because they give you more energy in hot environments. They last longer. And it's along this line of how do we get to 50 or solar? And so you'll see them put this together. Um, after this, um, you're going to see why we did this, and it's because we want to be able to clean and use cleaning robots. There's the adhesive going in. Again, visual, very strong. It's what's used in bridge bolt construction. Uh, we have Black and Veatch third-party reports. We have wind tunnel studies. It's been a well-engineered solution. And the point for all of this is, again, A, rotate 120 degrees. Get all the energy you can get. Go up and over hills. Those are dual glass panels. No extra cost to use the heavier dual glass panels. Use CAD tell, use crystal silicon, whatever you like. And you were talking about this issue with poorly designed trackers. And here's one that is, and it has a damper on it. And his won't do this because he did the right work. But this is what happens when you don't design a tracker well. This is at low winds with a tracker galloping. They actually have a, a damper on this one, but it's not effective because the angle of wind can vary and the natural frequencies can get above what that does. So you want a well-designed tracker with a company that's done the work. This is our engineer bragging and showing that I don't have an issue. He's shaking it and it doesn't transmit along. Normally on a torque tube tracker, if you shook it, it would, it would rock the whole system. And the last clever piece it, we stole from the Swiss watch industry. We use a Geneva gear to disengage the tracker. We actually turn a tracker into fixed tilt, so it's very strong at high wind. So what you're seeing that do is basically disengage from a gear, take torsional loads, you're trying to hold a, a beam, and then turn it into an A-frame radial loads. So again, I can use less metal. I can use 34 tons per megawatt peak, which is a lo lot less than most other trackers, yet give you better superior performance validated by wind tunnel studies. So that's what we've done. And the last piece I'll end with here is the cleaning, uh, which is I save the robotics for last. Uh, you'll see our approach here is you can do dry cleaning, you can do dry and wet, but you want to be able to do both because you don't know seasonally what your soiling is going to be. Uh, and uh, this is on a, a fixed silt system. Um, this, it's using water in this case. It uses 200 milliliters per panel versus a human, which uses a liter. But uniquely, it's automatically filling up and then traveling row to row. So it's very efficient as an asset. We don't sell the robots, we sell the service. Uh, so we've designed it to be very effective. Um, you'll see it go, uh, those metal parts are seismic and wind shoes. It parks on those during the day and charges. 
It's lithium battery powered, so no diesel, no truck rolls to the site when you have a soiling event. It does a very good job of cleaning. Uh, and uh, we have it in different configurations, configuration for fix, configuration for tracker, you see here. And uh, finally, uh, the other nice thing is we can do under the panel, not just the top of the panel. So I'm spraying coatings to make the junction box last longer. I'm doing hotspot detection. And for, dual, for bifacial, I'm spraying orchard lime down to boost the albedo, make it winter during this in the desert. Okay, so that's really the most what I wanted to say. If you have more interest, uh, we have very good comparisons versus market leaders. Um, and I would summarize this, if anyone here is an asset owner and trying to improve your IRR, I just showed you a bunch of technology. How do we put it into a Excel sheet? Well, forget the 90 cents, that's an old chart, but the concept is well, which is if I can avoid you drilling, I can probably save you, save you three to five cents a watt on your project, right? Concrete is low cost in India. Right? I, I will be happy to do that math with anyone on a break. So first I'm going to let you build faster. I'm going to save you money on your actual execution. I'm going to save you money on the cleaning. And I'm going to get you more energy because you're going to clean all the time. And then further, you're not, the banks aren't going to give you 50 years today. We're going to work at that over years. But maybe they'll give you five years more because you have a concrete foundation that doesn't rust and you have automated O&M. And so if you see that walk, that's almost 300 basis points. So you can go beat up the Jinko guy and try to get more blood out of him, but he's at almost stoichiometry levels of how much energy goes into the glass and silicon. There's not a lot more to get. Or we can start working as an industry to optimize technologies to get better returns. And that's what we recommend. And my final point would be this. I'm old enough to remember that I thought it was cool to have a Sony Discman, right? But the day that they came out with the iPod, I felt like a caveman and I had to put it in a drawer and never look at it again because I was old fashioned. Let's make sure we're not being old fashioned in the way that we're approaching combining solar technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, quickly, I'll ask Vinit, you have a presentation? Okay, great. So we need to wrap this up by 1.30. So we'll keep maybe 10 minutes for questions. So you'll have to excuse me till 1.40. No questions. All right. So no question. So you can meet us individually and uh, ask us whatever you feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, last speaker before the lunch. So pretty difficult to sustain. Uh, thank you, Ananji and the uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, great opportunity to speak in front of all of you. Uh, we are talking about technology and uh, various new things that we are seeing from the market leaders across the world. But in India, we are also looking at adapting those technologies and commercializing them into the markets. I have a stat. Uh, currently, we are having more, thousand, more than 1,800 channel partners at MNRE on the official website. So these are the channel partners who are actually going to do the rooftop installations and uh, they are the people who are directly talking to the end clients, uh, who is our first time installer, who is not a developer, and whose main job is not solar power development. His main job is to run, run the industry or the college or school, something like that. So uh, the lot of uh, new entrepreneurs who are coming to market like us, we are in the market for more than say three, four years. But then there are new players coming every day. 1800 are the people who are registered with MNRE as channel partner, and there will be more, much more than that who are not registered with MNRE and who are not having access to the high level of education and uh, research that we are seeing here. So we really want to commercialize and educate the people how solar has to be installed on the rooftop. So we are talking about the 40% of the 100 gigawatt, the rooftop market that uh, MNR has envisaged for India. So I'm focusing more on the 40% rather than the 60% which has been discussed uh, since the morning. Uh, few basic points uh, in the rooftop market that uh, are required in terms of the quality of installations. Uh, firstly, the installer has to understand the power scenario of the customer. The harmonics, the earthing, the uh, transformer capacity, those are the initial uh, checks that an installer has to do before he goes to the site and does installation for the steel plant, for the aluminum industry, for various such kind of uh, sectors who are having spike load or diff different types of uh, power uh, requirements. So we had faced uh, issues with harmonics 
and uh, because of those harmonics, our inverters were shutting down. So I mean, we are confused what is happening. So and going deep into the picture, there was the PF was very low, the spikes were very high, the uh, transformer was not uh, completely uh, having the pro proper ratings and everything. So we have to educate the customer that you just have, don't have to install the solar, you have to in improve your power quality also. You have to uh, save on the power that you are consuming. They don't know how much power they are consuming, they just pay for the electricity bills so that comes every month. So we try to help them understand their power bill, where they are losing money and how we can improve not just by installing solar but conserving their existing power requirements. We have seen that uh, there are a lot of uh, shadow analysis uh, errors done in the market. Uh, looking at the utility scale, there are expert engineers who do uh, install the systems but in the rooftops there is always a challenge of less space and you need more power. So people tend to have more panels in the same square feet area available in the roof and they tend to uh, ignore the whole stereo analysis. They will say that at least six months it will generate power, but what about the next six months or three months when it is going to have shadow on the other panel? So we really need to understand the stereo analysis part, the whole AutoCAD drawings and Google SketchUp that we all need to do to make a good PVRA layout. We need to know the strength of the roof. Uh, people are installing solar plants on the asbestos roofs, which are 20 years old, 25 years old, and then they expect the solar plant to run for another 25 years, which is beyond imagination. So uh, looking at the uh, performance and the whole solar system thing, but existing roofs also need to be uh, uh, understood. The structure engineer has to give a proper report whether it is able to uh, take so much of load or not. So we have to go deeper into the existing roof profile of the customer. A Lot of times uh, in these uh, side roofs, there are a lot of piercings, lot of holes done on the roof without proper planning. So they do a trial and error and do the system installation directly on the roof without having a proper uh, design. So that uh, results in a lot of water leakages and things like that. So we have to make sure that we don't end up uh, puncturing the roof of the customers. Also the earthing and the lighting arresters part. Again, I'm telling, saying all these because these are uh, factories or schools in the middle of the cities. So these are uh, high risk prone in terms of if a particular incident happens in one factory or a school or a residential, it can have impact in the nearby locations also. And they do not always have equipment for fire extinguishing and things like that. So we need to make sure the earthing and the lighting arresters and all those uh, things are taken care of properly. New things that are coming in the market are the synchronization of solar with their grid with having a DG set and also a battery backup. So we have to give a solution not just for solar but we have to give a solution for, for the whole power as in where they will get the power from, uh, at what time. So on, during the daytime if the power goes off how will they get power with the DG how they synchronize with solar and with the new batteries coming in the market and for critical loads you cannot uh, shut down the system so you need to have batteries and then battery gets to power from the solar or grid so there are a lot of synchronization happening and we need to uh, plan our inverters accordingly so that in the future the customer does not have to again uh, pay for the hybrid inverters if we can do it right now itself. So safety part I again want to uh, stress upon uh, we have to make a very uh, deep analysis of the wind load. We have to make a very deep analysis of the uh, railings. People don't really put railings on the side roofs. So it's quite risky people doing O&M and uh, cleaning on the roof and they go on the roof without a proper access. They just somehow manage to climb on the roof. I'm talking about ground level scenario where we have seen systems installed where we can't imagine walking on the roof. So we need to uh, have all the safety features when a person goes on the top and does these uh, maintenance and cleaning exercises. So all in all, I want to sum up is that we have to commercialize the technologies in a way that the whole market uh, installs them in the proper manner so that they last their uh, lifetime and uh, they have a positive impact in terms of the distributed generation where power is required. So we can, uh, as Ananji said, we have to not just target at the 100 gigawatt, we have to target at the availability of affordable power for each individual of the country. Thank you. Thanks, Vinny. That was uh, pretty impressive and quick. So I'd like to thank everyone who's uh, attended here. Lunch, I mean, 
in another two minutes once we're done with the photographs. Yeah, and the sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, so. Looking at all these bids that has happened, and I was wondering what is really bringing the price at these kind of levels. So I thought. Uh, I think the answer lies to a great extent in technology. So that's the reason we produced a technology conference and I would like to thank uh, this session for uh, you know enlightening our audience with what technology has to offer and how technology is contributing every bit to make solar more and more efficient and affordable. Thank you very much. Big round of applause ladies and gentlemen. May I now request uh, Ritesh ji uh, as a session chair to present uh, Mementos of appreciation to all the session panelists, please.